Here we go. All right, hi, and good afternoon. I'm Kim from Therapy Travelers, and I'm excited today because I have in front of me um, one of our art educators by the name of Alexandra Ogle. Um, and she's here today, just so you guys know, she is one of our fabulous therapists. Um, last month for February um, 2020, she was awarded our Spotlight Award. And our Spotlight Award goes to two therapists or nurses or special ed teachers. So two professionals that continue to live out of our values. Our values being integrity, um, doing work with excellence, community, and an acknowledgement of work done well. And Alexandra continues to do that day in and day out. So we're, again, really excited to have her here today. Um, we're going to take this time to do an interview so she can share with you guys um, what an art educator does. Um, you will notice her passion. You will hear her drive. Um, and I'm very excited that, um, Alexandra, I just want to say thank you. And I'm excited to have you um, with us for the next few minutes. So thanks for your time. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. I'm excited. Absolutely. Okay, let's get started. All right. So um, our first question for you is, why did you become an art educator? So I became an art educator because I just had a passion for art, always have been doing it since I was 10 years old. And it's really just been something I wanted to manifest. At first, I wasn't really sure how I wanted to do it. For a long time, I thought I was going to just be a painter. And then after undergrad, I started teaching private lessons. And that's when I really started connecting more with the education field. And I started um, substitute teaching at local schools. And I just really got into it and then became a high school art teacher. I was a high school art teacher for the last nine years and then recently made the switch uh, with Therapy Travelers and I've been very happy since I started with you guys and I do now more of a therapy based art education and that really started kind of coming to me in more of a concentrated way in 2011 to 13 when I went to grad school. My program there was at Moore College of Art and Design in Philly, and it was an MA in art education with an emphasis in special populations. So it's working with students with special needs, all different types of needs. We had to each do a thesis, mine focused on anxiety. And through that, I really started to study. I was reading a lot of articles and, you know, data out there that talked about how the benefits of art could help pretty much anybody, but specifically individuals with disabilities. And then I wound up also teaching at a local jail near me through one of my um, adjunct positions. And that really was the game changer for me that kind of set me on track with working with high risk populations and art. So that's how I got started in this field. Wow, you've been all over. You got your hand in a lot yeah. of different types of environments. That's I great. Can too. So talk a little bit um, on the art-based therapy piece. What exactly is it? Okay, so a lot of people probably are like a little confused and um, probably don't really know a whole lot about it. It is more of a newer field that's out there, but I am really the cross between art educator and art therapist. I'm not a clinical art therapist, but I am a certified teacher with the special ed background. And what I do is infuse therapy practices into the curriculum that I'm working with, with the students or groups or individual. Art therapists, and I do work with a girl who is an art therapist, they particularly stay strictly with working with your cognitive abilities and working towards a set goal. Whereas an art educator is giving you specific projects, learning about skills and techniques. So I'm kind of merging the two together and kind of working with individuals or groups on how to control behavior, how to work through personal struggles, a lot of self-identity and community identity in the projects. So it's as if the two kind of had a baby together and that would be my job. <laughs> so talk a little bit about the population that you work with. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So with Therapy Travelers, my group of students are considered high risk. There are alternative schools, there are emotional support classrooms. I also have individual caseloads that I work with in, um, you know, uh, 
with the district's um, LPC. And we kind of get together and we kind of plan out, you know, what I need to do with the different kids and what their goals are, what their IEPs are, what they're working towards. So a lot of my students, they've been incarcerated, they're in and out of jail, they're homeless, they're severe trauma victims and trauma ranges from deaths in the family to abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, mental. So it's a wide range of different types of behaviors. There's also anxiety, depression, that quiet anxiety. So I'm not always seeing the reaction that I see with most of my groups. Sometimes it's more of a subdued level. So it's, a, it's quite a range. And then you have your students with disabilities in their special education. So it encompasses a whole big range of students and populations that I'm working with. Right, man. It yeah, it's a large range as you were mm -hmm. talking about it. You know, the one word that comes to mind um, is restoration, yes. right? You know, I, I feel like your job provides so much, much of that, right? Like yeah. it's restoring people to, um, to a space of normalcy for them, right? Mm -hmm. Where they it, might very much is, it very much is restorative practice. It's an excellent way to describe what I do because even though I'm coming in with maybe specific projects like an art educator would and say, oh, these are the techniques or the, you know, the skills that we're gonna work on, I still am incorporating different therapeutic aspects to try to get them to have more self-control, to be more aware, to be able to take risks, which is really hard for that population. Everything yeah. seems like for them needs to be perfect. So they really struggle with coming in, I think, um, most of them, if not all of them, have told me that they don't do art, they don't like it. And I'm just persistent, I'm patient, and I keep pushing them and I keep working with them and trying to adapt it to, you know, their likes, their dislikes, and keeping our subjects and our projects more in line with what they like and contemporary culture so that it really keeps them interested and at least willing to try and experiment. And once I get them there, then they're willing to take more leaps and more risks and more experiments. Right, right, absolutely. They trust you at that point, right? They know, yeah. they know the leader. Trust. <laughs> right, there you go. So I am so curious, what does, I hate to use the word typical, because I feel like not every day is going to be typical, but what okay. would a, a, a day look like for you um, as an art educator, um, you know, doing art-based therapy? So you hear that term art on the cart, that's very much <laughs> with my district. I am the traveling, rolling art on the cart because I'm going to, on average, about three to five schools a day. I see 12 schools a week. So I start in the morning with whatever group that I have and then I just continue and go from there. I try to pack my materials. The biggest thing though that I would say is that you really have to be flexible because sometimes I show up and I could have a full class and everybody works the way that they're supposed to. There's other days I come in and we're having emotional breakdowns. We have kids that aren't wanting to come to class, kids that aren't in school due to absence. So every day is a totally different, I call it like the art jungle. You just never know really what's gonna happen. So you really have to kind of go with the flow. And I always try to bring backup projects because sometimes you know, and you're gonna fail a little bit and you just have to figure that out. I, there were some projects I started with the beginning of the year and I just wasn't getting kids engagement. So I just had to stop and say, all right, what can I do to get them engaged? And a lot of it is keeping them active. When they're active and they're able to use their hands and they're able to rip paper or use clay, it really keeps them more focused and allowing them to release that energy. So I do see, like I said, 12 schools a week, it's K through 12. So there's really no distinction between grade level. And the environments are about the same just because it's alternative school and emotional support classrooms. So I could have as many as 18 in a class, but as little as two. So it really just depends. And then my individual caseloads, I meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. So it's a little bit of everything. Yeah, it sounds that way. It seems to be the jungle for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I have that written down, the art jungle. 
<laughs> My goodness. That's exactly what it is. You just have to be prepared for anything. And you really can't take anything personally. I mean, right. thick skin is key. You got to let the comments roll off your back because I mean, I've had times when kids just shut down emotionally because they're, and you just don't know. It, it's not really you per se. Like it's not always my fault or my presence being the indicator, but they could have come in and had a really bad morning and you just have to respect that space and know that like, you know, if you have that trust with them, if you've developed that relationship with them and you know that they've worked for you, maybe everybody has an off day. I mean, I'm never a hundred percent all the time. So I just try to keep that in mind. And I think that's a big component when you're working in this field. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay. So I want to hear from you why you think a district should hire an art educator, you know, that is experienced in art-based therapy. What are the benefits? Okay. Absolutely. So I think, you know, my personal push for it, I think every district should have it. I know there's definitely limitations, but the biggest thing that I would say with this position is it gives kids an outlet that they don't always have to verbalize. And that's really a big struggle that I've seen even when I wasn't with therapy travelers and just in a regular art classroom, seeing kids every day, the same kids, you know, you have to be cognizant of what's happening. And there's a lot of outside factors that play a role in the way that school works and you can't control it. You have no idea what's going to happen like I was talking about the art jungle you just don't know so with this type of field and having a person like myself in a district you can work with groups you can work individually and you can I do a lot of self-identity a lot of community-based projects because at least it's a starting point for them to look inward and it helps them kind of pacify that stress that anxiety that mental shutdown the depression Overall, there's a lot of statistics out there. There's a lot of research out there with substantial data that will tell you that this helps and it helps with retention. It helps with kids staying in school, coming back to school, giving them some way and avenue for them to succeed. A lot of times kids who struggle academically seem to typically do a lot better in the arts, whether it's art, whether it's music, dance, some sort of expressive creative outlet. So it's going to help with all those factors. It's going to help with them being able to control themselves, not having meltdowns and needing, needing to leave class or maybe having to see the counselors all the time. You know, and a lot of times too, you have those kids that have that quiet anxiety when they're shutting down and just depressed or they just don't want to come to school because of fears or phobias. So this gives them an opportunity to creatively express what's happening without having to verbalize it. And I think that's key because a lot of today, it seems like nobody really talks anymore. Like we're just starting to talk about mental health, which I think is an amazing thing. But when you think about how we communicate with one another, we're not so quick anymore to pick up the phone and call our friends. We'd easily text or send an email because it's just easier. You know, it's an easy barrier that we don't have to cross. And confronting somebody face to face, you know, looking them in the eye, that's difficult for a lot of adolescents and elementary kids. So being able to just use creative resources, whether it's, you know, sometimes the pressure too of the materials, like pounding out the clay and wedging it or using crayons and really putting some force on the paper, that's therapy in and of itself, just getting that emotion, that feeling out of you. So I think it's really benefit, I mean, it's beneficial for anybody, but especially your populations in school where you have special education or high risk populations, emotional support classrooms, it's gonna do nothing but benefit and support those kids even more. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so I wanna hear a story. Uh, Alexander, I want to hear a story um, of a student that you worked okay. with. Um, I, I wanted to start with this question, and I'm like, I can't just rush there. But <laughs> I love the personal stories. Yeah, so I have a lot, but I have one student in particular. Um, he just started with the one alternative school that I work at, I would say late January, beginning of February, right when first semester changed. He was removed from his primary high school due to some behavior issues. And he came into the alternative school with just like a edge to him. He had an attitude and the sense of, you know, 
that he wasn't going to do anything that you told him to. He also knew some of the kids that were already at the school. So I think that was kind of a little ripple that caused him to come in with this, you know, power tone about him. And the first couple weeks were really tough. I'm not going to lie. I was a little intimidated, but I never tried to let him know. He was sometimes confrontational with me, would not sit at the table, tried to do everything opposite of what I was asking the class to do. And then he also was trying to get some of the other kids to pull away that were always working for me. So it was a real struggle. And I just kept saying to myself, you know what? I'm going to make him my project. I want to get to know him. I want to see what he can do. And I'm not going to give up because I think that's the easiest thing to do is give up on kids like this. And especially in this population, sometimes, you know, what they say or how they behave, it does, you know, tend to get under some people's skin, but you just have to realize like, it's just a reaction. It's a behavior. It's a defense mechanism is really what's happening. So I struggled for about three weeks. He would do minimal, minimal work, maybe five to 10 minutes out of a 45 minute block of time with me two days a week. And I decided like, I've just got to get them engaged. Like, what can I do? So Black History Month was happening because we just changed to February and I really wanted to get them doing something for that and celebrating that because I think it's very important. So I told them we're gonna do a little bit of a painting project, sort of abstract, kind of like the pictures actually that you see behind me, where we started with a background first. So there's no right or wrong. And that's the beauty of art is you can do whatever you want. And there's really, you're not trying to achieve a test. You don't have to say this is right, this is wrong. And it just takes the pressure off and giving kids the opportunity of free choice is really a huge benefit. So I told them to tell me about three people that they were interested in kind of representing for Black History Month. And unfortunately, right before this, Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gigi had just passed in that tragic helicopter accident. So he actually chose to focus on Gigi. He was adamant. He's like, I'm not going to give you three. I'm going to give you one. And that's who I want to do. So I was like, okay, you know what? You're, you're helping me out here and you're doing the work. So I'm going to work with you. So it's a little bit of a collage based project. I actually have it here. So I'll show you um, what we did. And I'll try to get it a little bit closer so you can see it. We took a palette knife and painted the background first. And he probably did about three to four different layers. So he worked three to four different class periods on this just for the background. And what they did was they built up a super textured application of paint. They went through probably every tube of paint that I had and um, they just were applying and using the palette knife. It was so nice. It's very mindless. You're just kind of moving the paint around and layering it on and seeing what you like. And if you don't like it, you cover it up. He also started experimenting a little bit with imprints and taking paper and stamping over the paint and then removing it to see it. And then he chose Gigi, cut her out, and then collaged her onto this. This is canvas paper. So he collaged her on there and then I gave them paint sticks. So you can see like the little details around there. It says RIP and then their numbers, her and her dad's number at the bottom. So he really, this was the first project he did for me that was 100% complete. And it was just amazing to see the effort and to see him engaged. And then after that, he kept coming back to me saying, can you give me more palette knives <laughs> and canvas paper? And I gave him, you know, what I had and he just kept wanting to do it. He really seemed to like that engagement. And I think it's just because he got that power of choice and was interested in like not having to have set standards. So it really worked for him. And I felt like that was a success, a huge Feet for me because we made that connection and after that you know I got the sense that he trusted me and he was okay with you know trying out different things and seeing what the class was going to offer him. Hmm. That's beautiful. Okay. I mean I, for for those of us in the California area and really I should say nationally yeah uh, that was such a loss with Kobe and Gigi a and I can loss. only imagine for a young man who probably found that family to be um, a role model, right? Mm -hmm. So it kind of, I would imagine it strikes the score in him, right? Like yes. that, that, that this allowed him to get those emotions out that might have been stuck within. 
Yeah, and I think it's important too when you're working with this type of population, you have to support them. So I just made sure, like, I give everybody their space. I try not to be the hovering art teacher asking a thousand questions, you know, and I'm just encouraging them. I was so happy. I kept telling them, you know, I'm incredibly proud of this. I want to keep it and put it in the art show. And you could just see, you know, they don't always show you every emotion. They're these tough 17, 18 year old men who you know want to have this little swagger about them but they were proud inside and you could see it without having to see the big smile or like that verbal acknowledgement of it so it really you know you have to keep your options open and just be willing to fail if it doesn't work the first time try it again or try it a different way so it's really important i think to keep that subject matter relevant for them and Gigi and Kobe that was a huge huge topic I had a couple other schools that wanted to focus on that too so it did help and it was like a nice release for the kids in a way of like remembrance right the release yeah absolutely well I'm excited I mean I want to see pictures of the art show when that yeah. happens <laughs> yeah, when it happens because COVID shut us down as <laughs> soon as this is over Yes. Um, and I, I, I have one last question um, because sure. I cannot stop staring at the beautiful artwork behind you. <laughs> I mean, Thank it's you. beautiful. So if you could just um, really quickly share. Sure. Yeah. So I've been doing art for a long time. Um, the series that you see behind me, we're in my studio. So these are what are up on my wall. But I did this a couple years ago. I was investigating different themes in society at that time. And the one that I kept noticing was just severe judgment of different cultures and races and backgrounds on the news outlets specifically. And, you know, sometimes you watch the news, it just gets too negative. And it just was something that kept bothering me. So I, I call these ladies my queens. There's about five or six of them total. And what I did was I researched a number of different cultures and backgrounds and I merge them together. So when you look at them, you might think you know where this individual's from, but really there's probably, I'd say on average, three to six different cultures and identities phased into one picture. So my artwork's really colorful. If anybody has seen my work before, you're gonna know what it is because it's very vibrant in your face. I love bold, saturated colors. And typically I'm drawn more to doing portraits or figures. So I really took my time with this series and I made the background very abstract because I didn't want that to be the focus. I wanted that to kind of highlight almost like a halo or a silhouette around the ladies to show who they were. And they all kind of have, you know, simple looks about them. Nobody's really smiling or giving you any clue. And it's just to kind of acknowledge that before you judge, get to know, get to understand because there's more to a person than just, you know, a title or a nationality. So that's what this series is all about behind me. I love it. I love it. I love the boldness. Your shirt is boldness, my friend. Yes. I love yes. it. Well, I gotta <laughs> thank you. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Thank Your you. job is so significant. I mean, I just cannot imagine um, the smile on a child's face when they hear from their art th therapist or art educator that they're proud, that their work is beautiful, that their work has significance, right? It gets them outside of themselves. Um, and you did, you did say, you know, you said the comment, I don't know if people have seen my work or you might have seen my work. For those that are listening um, right now, she's created a coloring book that is available to all students. It's actually available to everybody. So if you go to our website, www.therapytravelers.com, and there's a tab on the right-hand side that says remote resources. If you hover over that tab, there will be a drop-down. And toward the bottom part of the drop-down, it says coloring book. And there is a, down, there is a coloring book there that you can download. Um, and they're all pieces that Alexandra has designed herself. Um, mm -hmm. And your students can be very bold <laughs> in their yeah. color choices, um, and it's something that they can do at home. It's something that you as a therapist can provide to them, or you as a district can provide um, to Absolutely. get them inspired. So those are free resources that are available to you from Alexandra. 
So thank you. Thanks for being part You're of welcome. our story. Thanks for being part of Therapy Travelers. Thanks for taking the time to um, shed light on the work that you do day in. Day Absolutely. Out. Thanks for having me. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye.